Pascal because they're both batch-oriented languages. And uh, you will see some C examples occasionally. The user can customize his environment, something very easy to do that you often miss when you go back to COAST. So some examples here of TCP commands. We can tell net to 218, give us our login name and password, and we're in. And you'll read a 5.0 system if you get in today. And the first thing I generally like to do on the system is an LS and also a PWD. LS is like audit, and PWD will tell you where you are in the file system. Our login is available on the XMP. I don't recommend it because right now it's character oriented and I think there's a performance penalty in using that. A lot of people have used it in the past because it didn't pa prompt for password and you just do our login to the machine and you're in. It didn't pa prompt for name or password. With 5.0 and security turned on and stuff, you would probably have it prompting for password. You'd probably want to run it that way anyways. And this example shows it with the password prompt only on a secure system. But I use Telnet. FTP, FTP I'm not so fond of. It, it's more of a hacker's tool. Uh, generally, I have more than one file that I want to transfer, and I like to do it quickly. And that's why I use RCP, the remote copy. Uh, I can do it in less keystrokes. The only time I really do use FTP is when it's not my file, I guess, and that's what I mean by hackers. Uh, you go around finding somebody else's file and c copy it over the network or whatever. So with this one, I did an FTP to 218, gave my name and password. It went through some responses. In this case, I did a send Fortran, and a send is going to go from, uh, since I invoked this on, on training, I'm going to send Fortran off to the Cray. Then I did an LS. A bang LS will tell me what's on my file system instead of the front end. And then a quit is how I get out. The way I use it, though, is typically with RCP. And I've got some examples here. Now, to use RCP, there's a .r host file that has to be set up. And you also need that for the remote shell. There's an example of that. Uh, in this case, RCP 218 file is going to go from 218 to my uh, training machine where I am. The most common one I use is this one down here to do uh, backups of my files and stuff. I've got a directory in my home directory on the front end where I make sure I've got latest backups of, of things that I do. Another advantage of RCP over FTP is that RCP will work in a NQS script or make files, things of that nature. FTP is interactive only. So RCP is like the fetch and dispose of the TCP world. Now there's an example of the uh, validation files on page 311. I want to show you one other command and then we'll go on. I've set up a whole bunch of uh, scripts just so that when I'm working in a station TCP environment, I can monitor the Cray without having to go through the login process. And there are just uh, a couple of things I want to point out here. One of the things is, is the remote shell allows you to do file transfers across the network. And I've got an example here of a script called RQSub. And I would type in RQSub and then the job that I'm submitting. Inside that script, I have a cat, concatenate a file. And I'm going to pipe whatever is in job into the remote shell and transfer it to whatever dollar crate T was in my dot profile, which was SN218. And on that front end then, or I'm sorry, on the cray, wherever I'm sending this off to invoking the remote shell, on crate T, I'm going to execute a cat, take its output into dollar one again, and then submit that to NQS in this example. Now, other applications have used this for kind of a distributed processing capability to, for example, do a compare on a third machine or something like that. So you'd have some code running on one machine, more code running on a different machine, the outputs of those being piped into a third machine that's then processing and 
and synchronizing the data coming in from these other two applications. So this is kind of a lazy man's way of getting some distributed processing going. And TCP is really our, our foothold in the distributed processing capabilities. Uh, this is the easiest way to use it. If you wanted to get a printer going in this building, the bottom line is the one I want to show you. I have a script called, on Unicoast, you'll write a script called PRNT, and then you can invoke it with whatever file you want to print. It will then cat the file, pipe it to the remote shell, send it to training, and print it on our printer. So that's the line you'd use. You can invoke that whole line or set up a script to do it. So the remote shell has some slick things that can uh, help you use that network transparently or a lot easier than you could in a station environment. Next couple of pages just show that what the station looks like. And uh, again, those 218Us are now just 218. There's no ghost environment on that machine. Why don't we take a break? And we'll come back and do a user level comparison. OK, the next section starts on page 4.4. Probably the first obvious difference any user is going to find when they log into the system is that the command line is different. There is no longer a period to terminate every line. Some people think that's great. Point to I keep in mind is that to me the period was always that closing point. As I was pushing that period, I was closing my statement and looking at my command line to say, did I remember UQ? Did I remember this or that? In Unicos, it's a lot easier to hit that carriage return without thinking, shall we say, and uh, do something uh, accidental. <laughs> I have wiped out things before. I try to teach not to use wildcards just by habit so that you don't accidentally do something you didn't think you were going to do. <laughs> wildcards can uh, save you a lot of time, but uh, be real cautious of them. I, I did lose a couple days worth of work once. In COAST, we have what's called the verb, and the verbs are found in the system directory. In UNICOST, there's a path variable that specifies a search path to find command names. So in COAST, you can only change the SDR by the administrator level. UNICOST, the user can modify his path and pick what he wants to access. Makes it a lot more tunable. And typically, a user is going to add his own binary directory and his own utilities that are in his own slash bin file. And in fact, in my DAW directory in my slash bin are a bunch of these uh, migration tool uh, binaries. All the sources in tool 3.0. But I also have in bin all the binaries. Coast read is in there as well, that sort of thing. Now in, in uh, Coast, everything was uppercase. Even if it was typed in lowercase, it got converted to uppercase. Unicos is case sensitive. Typically, everything is in lowercase. You will, however, find options and various other things that will appear in uppercase. You should decide in your standards for converting your codes on site whether you want applications to continue to use uppercase file names or lowercase. I might also point out split, F split, when it splits apart an application, uses uppercase names from the Fortran source. So you will get a mixture. Uh, the, the trouble with uppercase, lowercase mixed is that extra keystroke to hold the shift key down and stuff. The keyword and the verb are separated by commas in COS. In Unicos, it's spaces. Space is what delimits the command and it's options that then follow. And we can also, in COS, often use parens as an open and closed terminator on the options. And these normally are just found as a comma and a period, but you can do it either way. Unicos, neither are required. Uh, the keyword, in this case, we're looking at a CFT statement, is set up with an equal sign. In Unicos, we typically have a hyphen in front of the option key letter rather than on the end of it. And in Unicos, the on flags are enable flags. And dis off is a disable, a hyphen D. So the JCL converter will do that for you real easy with coast help and stuff. And in this case, we have flow trace set on. It's lowercase in Unicos. The JCL converter will put it out in lowercase. Now, another big difference I should point out just talking about CFT is that CFT in coast generates a listing by default to dollar out. 
In Unicos, listings are turned off by default. Save file space. If you want it on, you have to specify it like it's specified here. The next thing we have here is the parameter that's being passed with some sort of keyword. In this case, we're just sending flags. In this case, we're going to send a whole uh, string text type of thing. In Unicos, we typically call that an argument. And the arguments are what follows the option key letter. And I used to teach that for a listing, we generated as a source.l and used .l for listings. But Lex looks for, Lex is a tool available on Unix that looks for .l files. And make will get confused by .l files if they're not in Lex format. So by convention, I'm thinking to teach people LST, some other name. But .l will get you into trouble. The last thing, and uh, personally, I don't like this, but we have what are followed in the end of the line, to, uh, always at the end of the line, things called operands. And operands are typically case or position sensitive. And this is the di thing different from quotes. Users have to get used to position sensitive operands. And I've got an example here of a move command. Move file to new file. Do it the other way and file is gone. Same thing with copy, from and to. So operands are position sensitive. And users have to be aware of that to know how to use it. But it does follow logical thinking once you understand the Unix commands. You're going to copy a file from file to new file and read it as such. And with CFT and the compilers, C compilers, Cal compile or Cal assembler, the commands presently, if you're compiling a source, require the operand to have a, a suffix that specifies what type of source file it is. .f, .p for Pascal, .c for C language, uh, .s for Cal, this sort of thing. And these are specified on a page coming up. Now, Unix does break its own conventions. Uh, depending upon who wrote the command. That's a typical command line type setup. But there is a command called find. And you'll find find be one that has a whole word associated with it, rather than just a key letter. When you're implementing applications, try to get them to enforce Unix standards. And there is a document out to specify what Unicode standards are based upon Unix. But not everybody follows these, and it just makes it harder to uh, work with. But find is a thing like audit with the CW option or something like that, where you're looking for something specific. And in this case, find is doing a search. Find me the data set from my present working directory. A, a single period is a present working directory, wherever you are in the file system. If you change to root, that would give you the entire file system, root being the top of the file system. We're going to talk about that. Hyphen depth says recursively through all directories underneath. Hyphen name is when you're looking for a particular file that you're trying to find. And then hyphen print generates an output of, of that file list. Now, the funny thing is, is find won't generate any output without that hyphen print, and you need that there. So that's a command example that breaks its own conventions. Also, I've got an example here, ls. ls hyphen capital R. Capital R says recursive through all subdirectories. So that'd be a more global audit type of thing, rather than your present working directory. So you do have capital letters that appear in options and stuff. Uh, page 4 or 5 just shows us our wildcard. In COS, a hyphen is an asterisk in Unicos. And single character searches are uh, asterisk and cos are a question mark in Unicos. And the JCL converter converts those easily for you. Now, the levels of Unicos, we've already talked about the internal levels here. We have the kernel with its machine dependent, its file management, its I.O. management, process management, the demons around it, like NQS, USCP, TCP demons. We then have the shell. And the shell is what really parses the command line and acts like EXP and CSP does in COS. And there are two shells that are supported. The born shell, SH, is the AT&T shell. 
And this is the one that most closely relates to coast JCL. It's if-then structures and loop structures and all exit handling, all that sort of thing is the closest thing to coast JCL. They're both batch oriented. The seashell is the Berkeley version. And the big difference with the seashell is that it's organized like the sea language. So its constructs are going to be different than coast constructs. And also, it has an interactive history mechanism so that you can save keystrokes and invoke older lines and call them up again with uh, letter substitutions and things like that. I think that's the big reason that people use it, is the interactive history mechanism. The other advantage of the C shell is that once you've implemented a script in C language, you can uh, map it into the or C scripts. You can then map it into the C language and write it into the C compiler, run it through the compiler, generate binaries, and get better performance. So there's a performance issue there too, depending upon how much you're maintaining the script or something like that. Uh, but that's a consideration: is the fact that you can then re-implement it in the C language. Around that, then, are our utilities. I think most of you have our Unix background, so we'll just go through these quick. The cp command would be like copy d. It copies files. And the remove command is like delete and release. Gets rid of the files. And we'll talk about temporary data sets coming up later. There is a temporary data set concept in 5.0. You're in a directory that's going to go away when your job's done. So a release would be to remove any files in that temporary directory. And a delete would be to remove the files in your original file system. So NQS jobs have a temporary directory. And anything in there is local. It goes away when the job's done. And this primarily prevents NQS jobs from file name collisions. If they're all running in the same directory, then they're going to collide on Fortran units and stuff. So you have to have a unique directory for each NQS run. And we'll talk about that later. BLD and AR are library maintenance utilities. AR is a standard Unix. I'd use it if you're looking at portability across Unix environments. BLD, however, is a Cray-written tool, builds libraries that are smarter for segloader to work with. What this means is you're going to get faster performance out of libraries with BLD. And I would recommend the standards committee use BLD and teach that to the users that have libraries. Because your segloader, your link time will be faster. Has nothing to do with execution time. That's whatever the libraries do. Segloader and LD. Uh, LD does not include the Fortran environment and the scientific environment libraries. Now, with 5.0, there's a shell script now called LDR that uses LD and links all the path names for all the libraries. That's mostly used from the Cray 2 environment. And it, LDR has no relationship to COS LDR. That's a tool called LDOVL. Uh, I re recommend we use segloader. That really depends upon the site. There's a longer linkage time with segloader, and a lot of people have been using LD because of that. But uh, that's really something the standards committee has to look at. Fetch and dispose work the same way as in COS. FTP, RCP, remote shell we've talked about already for uh, TCP communication. VI and ED. A lot of sites have not allowed users VI access. Now you can, with the security level, with security feature, you can you know, allow VI on the system and only let particular users to use it. That way you can control it rather than letting 100 people use it. But many a site has not allowed it because of its character-oriented I.O. and the overhead involved in that. Uh, uh, instead, they have enforced ED, ED. Now the new uh, programming support environment, what's called PSE, uses Emacs. So in a training plan, in planning of migration right now, I would probably recommend you look more at the future in Emacs, because by the time you're up to, up to that point, that's available. It's running on the system now, but it has a lot of problems still. Now, I don't know if it's in 5.0 or not. But looking to the future, why train them on one editor and then change editors on them? But Emacs is something that's being included in this PSE environment. Uh, make. All gen jobs get converted to make files. Make has the advantage of looking at modification dates, uh, timestamp information on files, and determining whether it requires recompilation or relinkage. 
Uh, there is a utility called FMGen that will generate a make file for you and also split apart your application. Uh, but you may not want to teach your users FMGen because it would generate 300 inodes in your directory if you have 300 subroutines. Unix wasn't really built for scientific applications where you get thousands of entry points and subroutines in some applications out there. And that's where update comes in handy. SCCS is the standard Unix source control subsystem, or uh, source control system, <laughs> whatever. And it is uh, made available because it's a standard Unix port and available for people that know Unix. But it has a problem in trying to use it in a Cray environment because of the way it marks revision levels. In COS, we were used to working with what's called the SPR number. And the SPR number was tagged to a modification deck name in RPL so we could track our software very easily and uh, pull and retrieve and, and maintain these modifications a lot easier with this SPR tracking system. SCCS simply goes revision 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 2. You can you know, upgrade it to a new level and stuff. But we had no way of tagging SPR numbers into our uh, modification decks, so to speak. So an update was not available at the very beginning. And so they came up with this quick and dirty tool called SCM, Source Control Maintenance. And SCM was kind of a, a quick update before they had update available. SCM is used by a systems group to support the kernel and stuff like that. On the Cray 2, it's all SCCS. In the future, all of these are going away. Update is going to be renamed something called New Update, N Update. SCCS will always be there because it's a standard Unix port. But there's a new tool that may be considered looking at called SM, Source Maintenance, or USM is the way the product is described. But do a man on SM and you'll take a look at it. It's basically update and SCCS and SCM all mixed together. And you have all these directives that uh, create uh, modification decks, deltas, and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of all three mixed together. This is what the software development is going to use in the future for maintaining all their source. I really don't know about the future of new update after 6.0, but it's th they're obviously putting development effort in it to support longer deck names and periods and special characters in deck names. So an update seems to me if they're doing that much work on it, they're going to keep it around for a while. Uh, for file attributes, chmode is the command for security right now, other than SPACL. Chmode is what allows user, group, and other read, write, and execute permission. Now, there's no password associated with a file, but you could use crypt encrypt to encrypt a file with a password if you wanted to. You know, that would be the only comparable thing. But chmode is what's going to allow users particular access to uh, a file. And there's a command called umask, which sets up the default permission masks that you can then modify with chmode. With security on, chmode is checked first. And if, for example, user and group or group and other are turned off with chmode, then the access control list is checked. And if they're not in there, then access is denied. If they are in the access control list, they get to it. If chmode has permissions turned on, then the security never is invoked. It doesn't care. So Chmode can override the access control list. CD. CD is kind of like access. It basically jumps you around in the file system and moves you from one directory to another. If you do a CD space root, you go to the top of the file system and see what kind of subdirectories you are. And uh, gives you an idea of what the system you're like is on. Every system is going to have a slightly different file system configuration. And you're going to find that between the machines you have here as well. Everything from home directory down is typically the same from where you log in. PWD is uh, something you teach an initial user to tell him where he is in the file system. So that when he logs in, he can do a PWD and see where he is, do a CD to root and take a look at the whole file system, just to get an understanding of uh, where he fits into the file system picture. And then LS, LS is like audit. And LS with 5.0 also specifies migrated data sets. If, if you're familiar with the LS command, 
There are three types of files. There's directories, there's special files, and there's regular files. A regular file has a dash in the very first column of an LS. A migrated file has an M there. So if it's offline because of the data management system or disk management system, you're going to have an M in that column. And that's the only way a user knows that it's offline. Of course, he could put into his shell scripts dot profile when he logs in an M, a DM get with a wildcard and restore everything if he wanted. Uh, around this then are our applications, our libraries. We're going to talk about libraries later. C compiler, our assembler, AS. We cannot use Cal because that's a calendar. And we'd have too many people typing in Cal or shell scripts that use Cal from various environments and they'd get an assembler, they wouldn't know what to do. So AS is the standard name for the assembler. And CFT, there's a variety of different versions of CFT. Uh, 114, bug fix 8, 115, CFT 77, and also a version called CFT 2 for the Cray 2, which is pretty much a CFT 113. Now with 4.0 and 5.0, what you're more interested in probably is some new shell scripts or some new commands called CF and CF77. These are like the CC command in COS, or I mean CC command in Unix. They compile and call segloader and link it. And you can also autotask with directives on the CF and CF77 command lines. So that saves you keystrokes again. And then the custom shell scripts. I mentioned before this shell script down at the bottom is how I use the remote shell to get the uh, output to the printer here in this building. Anybody that needs help on that, I can get them started. Data set comparisons. In COS, we have dollar in, dollar out, and dollar log. Dollar in is Fortran unit five. Dollar out is Fortran unit six. And uh, what's log? One? I can't remember offhand. In Unicos, these are known as standard in and standard out. And the only thing that relates to dollar log would be standard error. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison. It's apples and oranges comparison. But that is what you can relate it to. And standard error is going to give you things like the compiler error messages and things that you don't want to go into your data. And looking at all of our files, $CS is our control statements, our JCL stuff. This is what's basically in uh, standard in, what's being typed into the terminal to the shell. And $in, $in is an implicit uh, local data set concept. It puts data actually in the job. And the comparable thing to that in Unicos is a here document, which is standard Unix type stuff. It puts the data right in the job. And I'll show you what a here document looks like later. I don't recommend that that's the best way to go in implementing things. You may just want to split it apart. It really depends upon the code and what the job's doing. If it's a compile, load, and go, I would recommend splitting it apart into a gen job, into a make file, and then a run script that you'd put NQS directives in front of. But you have to decide on site. Uh, some people still do use here documents and put all their uh, source in there. Dollar out is the same thing as standard out. And dollar log, what do we use dollar log for in COS? We use it for uh, debug analysis. Figure out how many job steps did we get before the job aborted. You know, what command was it on? Without dollar log, we wouldn't know how far it got along. In Unicos, that's that set hyphen X flag again, or the set hyphen V. And I'm endorsing the V flag more than the X flag these days because it gives the whole command line, including IO redirection and stuff like that. And I'll show you an example of this coming up. So with that flag set, it's designed in Unix to help you debug a shell script to figure out how far down the shell script did it get. So we're using those tools in the same way. However, in Unicos, that dollar log concept is not uh, put into any sort of log. It's not kept anywhere. It's just returned back to the user only. So it doesn't remain in the system log like in COS. $BLD is .o files. 
Segloader expects uh, input into it from .o file formats. And $xxlib is our library formats in COS. In Unicos, it's now libxx.a. There used to be a .o convention, but that was gone with 4.0. And in 5.0, 4050.a is the convention in both the X and the 2, which is in line with Unix conventions. $abd is our executable binary that comes out of segloader. In Unicos, by default, it's a.out. And you can execute a.out. I strongly endorse that you teach them segloader hyphen O option to change the output name. Reason being with PS and stuff, it's more meaningful to have the application name than it is a.out. It's easier to track what's going on with the system. You do a PS and everything says a.out, you have no idea what the codes are that are running. And you know, with a name you can attach to an application, you know what kind of uh, load it may have on the system. So. Uh, using the default a.out makes it a little tougher for you to see what's going on with uh, 100 users executing a.out applications. And we'll take a look at segloader to change that later. Dollar dump is created in COS by the dump job command, and then it can be analyzed by a variety of utilities. In Unicos, there's something called a core file, and this is created dependent right now upon the type of signal that you get. That's what really makes it creatable. There's still a lot of discussion going on in terms of how we can best control the core creation process, because core files can take up a lot of space. Uh, we don't want to create them every time, and, and nobody ever cleans up core files, these sorts of things. There is a plan that if there's a core file inode in that directory and it aborts, it will overwrite it. So if a user wants a dump, he'll do a touch core. And then when the system uh, goes through its abort process, it sees there's a file there named core and will create a full dump. The touch just created the inode. Uh, some process like that so you have better control of when core files are created or not because they can take up a lot of space and are not always needed. Now the core file can be analyzed in Unicos with CDBX. That's your best tool. But you also have debug and you also have octal dump, OD, to, to look at that thing. Dollar proc is procedure formats. Uh, there's no concept of a dollar proc format. In Unicos, everything is executable. If it's got execute permission and it's text, then it executes it as a shell script. If it's executable in binary, then it executes it as a c command. So the shell command, sh, all your uh, if then loop constructs, things like that are buried in the shell man page. You want to understand the programming language of the shell you look up the SH or the CSH man pages. And all you need really is execute permission on the shell script. Dollar PDS format is just simply a archiving format, a way of collapsing a bunch of files into one file in COS. In Unicos, we can use AR, we can use CPIO. And on the administrative level, we can also use dump and restore. In fact, the original COS read tool was written before that in something called PTOA, which went PDS dump to AR format. And then there was a CTOU command that went COS to Unicos format. Uh, they were rewritten into COS read, COS RD. I don't want to delve in this example, but a point I want to make is that in Unicos, scripts are positional sensitive. They pass their parameters in by a positional number. We have an example here of a command. Its file name is agen, and this is what's in agen, lines 1 through 14. And with spaces delimiting these things, we create a series of positional parameters that get passed into this shell script when it is invoked. Now, these are positional sensitive. In COS, procedures are keyword controlled. If you really wanted to continue that concept of keyword control, and not position sensitive, you could build some sort of parser in the front of your shell script. Now, it, it, you know, it has a lot of lines there. This is what the JCL converter does, though. It puts a, sh uh, it first of all sets hyphen x so that we can debug what's in the procedure when it's executing. Sets up the variables that are going to be passed into this uh, shell script. 
and then does a well test, the number of positional parameters is greater than zero. And it does this do loop. And in the do loop, it does a case test. It, it's looking for pattern matches between the F and what's on the right sides of the parens. The paren is kind of like the, the uh, delimiter between the pattern it's searching for and, the, and what it's going to do when it finds the pattern search. So in this case, if it finds F, it's going to make F equal to null. So our shell script will create a variable F and it will be null. If it finds F equals, then F is going to be whatever the second positional parameter was after the one that was the key letter. And then it does a shift. A shift gets all the positional parameters shifted down by one position. With this shift command, you can then go above nine positional parameters because the shell can only read zero through nine. And zero is the command itself. So if you want to go up to 100, you'd have a, a shift of 99 or something like that in there. And then this analyzes the second keyword. And if it finds a match there, it does a shift. If it does find a match after it executes the shift, it's going to go down at the end of this case test as ESAC, case backwards, and do a shift, which will get the second option out of the way. And then go through this test case again. So that's what a parser might look like. Yeah. Yeah, for this parser, because as, as we go through these, we want to shift them down one at a time. And we don't know how many we have out here. And we're going to throw them away, basically. Yeah. I've never, you wouldn't want to do that in here or nothing. But my point being is that if you really want to do it, Unix does offer a wide variety of ways of programming. And this is a way of putting a parser in front of a shell script. It's not standard Unix convention, though. Uh, facing page 411 has the JCL variables that are not supported, abort code, field length, uh, PDM status, sense switches, uh, time left is not supported. It also shows that the operator uh, comparisons are supported. The relationship between dot EQ is a hyphen EQ. All those are direct uh, translations. But we can't deal with abort codes, field length, and some of those things. Jobs that uh, look at abort codes and stuff don't have much meaning. There is abort status numbers passed, but certainly they don't map one to one in, into Unicos. But we do have the capability of what we would, might consider what's called reprieve processing, the ability after abort of invoking some additional commands to execute. And there are a variety of ways of doing this, two or three different ways easily. That are, that are presently being documented. First of all, there's an E flag that's set on the shell. The E flag tells them what to do on abort handling, whether, whether to uh, continue processing and things like that. The second thing we do, and this is actually found in standard Unix, in, in particular, the run account shell script in the accounting system does this. But it has a do done loop. And that's what I've got drawn in red here. While test 0 equals 0 is always going to be true, he's going to do this loop. And line 19 is the done portion of the loop. Line 19 would then translate to an exit statement in COS. So we've got two lines in front and two lines in the back replacing this exit statement. So we went from one line to four lines in the Unicos job. But inside the loop, if anything goes wrong, we can kick out of this loop and execute what's after the done statement on lines 20, 21, and 22. And the accounting system does use this technique in standard Unix. Inside this uh, job, then, we have a here document to create a data file called data that's going to have a 1500 in it. We're going to link that data to Fortran Unit 10 create a file called Fortran Unit 10 that the application then can open. And the double bar says, if this aborts, break. And the break is going to kick you out of the loop. So break is the abort path out of this loop. If it terminates normally, it will not execute what's to the right of those double bars. And we'll continue with the job. We then have another here document here, uh, cat into prog cft.f. Everything up to the delimiter, EOFA. Now, you see those single quotes around the delimiter? Recommended. 
does two things. Shuts off parameter substitution. In COS applications, you tend to have dollar ins and dollar outs floating around, things like that. If you had, if you had those missing, it would turn those into null strings, and the Fortran compiler would not know what that means. And in my case, when I had it happen to me, uh, it didn't even flag the line because it was a five or six lines continued statement and only started at the beginning. So I wasn't even looking at the plain problem. The second thing that that's going to do is since parameter substitution is turned off is give you a performance edge because it's not looking for pattern searches and stuff. It's not looking for dollar signs. A dollar sign means substitution in Unix. So I then create a file prog cft.f. I then compile it hyphen et prog cft.f double bar break. If something goes wrong with that comp compilation process, I can execute this stuff down here, which would be typical of the way a coast job would work. But you, you really probably don't want any diagnostic messages at that point. You don't want to dump with a compiler unless you're a uh, compiler support person. The only place you really want the break is on the application run itself. That's what you're usually debugging. So these other breaks would probably not even be necessary. But if something goes wrong, you don't continue going on with this process. You kick out and, and do something else. Segloader hyphen O option renames the output. In this case, I'm calling it Fort 10. Recommended so that when you're doing PSs and looking with uh, Cray Perf, you see the name of the application, not A dot out. A dot out, it just doesn't have any meaning to most people, except as a, a default. And then I'm going to compile prog cft.o, which was the default coming out of CFT. If something goes wrong, break out of this loop. And then we got for the execution of the application, fort 10, uh, double bar break. If something goes wrong and that thing aborts, it's going to break out and execute this stuff. The exit then, if everything goes right, the exit will kick us out of the loop. It will just exit the loop. It has no meaning to a cos exit. It simply says exit this loop, leave, or script. Exit this script, leave this script. The break is what got us out of the loop. Then we have debug here. Uh, debug can show you your trace and exchange package and stuff like that, same way as in cos. Octal dump, the only thing it relates to is, is the uh, DS dump utility in COS, and it just gives you your numbers. Uh, there isn't anything really like dump in COS because dump gives you vector register dumps, uh, a variety of options with it, JTA, stuff like that. The only thing you can compare it to in Unicos is CDBX, which can give you some of those things and trace and stuff like that. And CDBX is more of an interactive tool. Uh, the last thing we did here then is remove a bunch of files. This is one way of explaining temporary data sets. You remove them when the job is done. Now, this is no longer needed with 5.0. Now there are two other ways of invoking a reprieve processing concept. One of them is to, on the double bars, rather than break, with the C language you have the go to command. The C language will allow you to go to a label. And in this case the label is error down here. So with C, you can set up labels and go to them on an abort process. And the third way is with what's called a trap. Well, I guess I got a fourth way here, too. The third way is with a trap. And the trap, in this case, is something that I'm going to set up either in the beginning of the job or possibly in a dot profile or something like that. And trap says that if one of these signals comes in, execute what's in the single quotes. And what we're doing here is creating a shell script called error and going to put in debug and octal dump into error. <coughs> and then execute it on any of those signal numbers. A zero is a normal termination, so you should take that off. You don't, you don't need that one. These are some of the abnormal termination signals. And you can do a man space signal to see what signal numbers mean. Now there is a fourth way that I have a note here for, and that's that on the double, on the right side of the double bars, just put whatever command it is or script you want it to execute, whatever you want it to do on an abort condition. It could be a shell script called error. It could be a, a, a debug command or CDBX or anything like that. 
So there is reprieve processing. There, however, is no abort code uh, handling. Library comparisons. All our libraries are there in Unicos except for some of the syslib entry points. We got scilib is lib sci, arithmetic library is lib m. Uh, you might have noticed in Unicos or in Coast manuals about a year or so ago that your library manuals went to a man page format for Coast. The upper right says which library, the upper right corner says which library it's in. So you'll have 3F, 3M, 3 Coast, that sort of thing. There is also a benchmarking library available uh, that you can put out on site. I'm not sure what the release uh, is like right now. It was being held up a little bit. But the, the work is done. It is available. Yeah? Can you say which uh, routine GetPram has been converted to under live code? GetUp. It makes a GetUp call. That's a, with a T, GetUp? Yeah. Okay. Now, there's one mention in here of LibCoS. LibCoS is a developer's project here in Mendota Heights, and he put together a GetPram call a couple of years ago. And it's some Fortran routines that parse it and then call a C module, which makes a get op call. So we are supporting it. We don't guarantee it'll work in all fancy cases a programmer may have used it as, but it is a bridge for uh, what we think is at least, you know, 60% of what we're going to find out there. So that, I could find out about that in the library preference manual? Uh, this is a migration tool right now. Uh, I'll just get you the source. Okay. Which is uh, what I was going to do. Uh, so the source is in the tool directory in a li in a directory there called libmig, so you can copy it and it get you to there. Oops. And it, it's composed of. Uh, maybe six modules, one C module and five Fortran modules. And those Fortran modules are real small, three, four liners, written in a C fa uh, Unix fashion, very small subroutine per file. Other things going into libcos is memory, PPL, timestamp routines, uh, T remain, some of those sorts of things. T remain is available on the Cray 2, but not on the XMP. So, and we're still discussing and going over what's actually going to be in there. There's, for example, the system call. We can support some of them, but we don't want an application to compile and link and you know, go into a production mode with uh, a branch to a system call that's unsupported. So we have to be careful that when we can support it, we can fully support it. Otherwise, the programmer should be aware of it. Because there are a lot of system entry points that we can do, like operator messages and stuff. But if it touches an LFT, you're out of luck. And it would be too late at that point. It'd be in the execution stage. So we don't want to put in any entry points that don't satisfy the call correctly. And we're also discussing fetch and dispose. I think they should be standard uh, library entry points. And other people would prefer a call to iShell to do the fetch or dispose. I do not mind any code where it's a one-liner change. In my opinion, that's not so bad. It's when you have to rework the application. To, to rewrite it, like memory is a major job. So we'll talk more about that later. The environment that the programmer works into. You have all the same tools you had in COS. Different names in a couple cases, but everything's there. You have cross-references coming out of your compilers and assemblers. You have Cycle X, I don't think Cycle X S is available, but Cycle X analyzes Cal CPU times looking at the uh, instructions that it's going through. FT ref is available, which shows you your static calling tree and how your source is organized and who calls what. CFT 77, that's not CFT, but CFT 77 has a hyphen V for loop marks. There was a utility called loop mark before. It's now in the CFT 77 compiler. So CFT does not support it, but CFT77 will mark its loops with the V option. And segloader maps are also generated in the same way as on COS. 
dynamic tools. With CFT, you have flow trace, same way as in Coast with a uh, flag enable. You have perftrace.a. Now, this is something different in uh, Unicos because you have to compile your code with perftrace.a. You don't get it by default. So when you do your segloader statement, you have to know that you're going to run perftrace. Now, the JCL converter looks on the first pass for perfmon or perftrace, those sorts of things, and then hooks it to the appropriate library. But you're going to find that uh, in COS, there are flags that you switch in the libraries. In Unicos, you're going to have to link it with a particular library. And you're going to have a perf trace version, a procstat version, uh, a flow trace version, that sort of thing. Uh, procstat is the replacement for option stat equals on to give you your I.O. statistics. And it'll tell you what uh, device the file resides on and how many reads and writes are going on. There's also with procstat a proc report. Procstat is maintaining this trace, and then proc report formats it into a report for you. And feel free to try that on this Bowpace application if you're interested in that. And we have uh, documents that cover these things. And a man page should be useful too. HPM is the same thing as perfmon. And with 5.0, it looks identical. With 4.0, it just gave clock periods. It didn't do any conversion to ratios. But with 5.0, it looks the same as in COS. And then for those that are familiar with SPY, they're going to have to forget everything they knew about SPY. There's a new tool. Well, it's a standard Unix tool called PROF. And it has all the same capabilities, but it's a different tool. And I haven't gotten into the specifics of mapping, trying to figure out how to do things with PROF. But that's the counterpart to SPY and will remain because it is a standard Unix tool with enhancements. Debugging, you have tons of comparison utilities. Diff, big diff, compare, all kinds of stuff. Uh, flow, there is a flow command to look at flow trace information. MT dump for multitasking dumps. Octal dump is kind of like DS, or DS dump, I mean. Sorry. DS dump just gives you your uh, raw file structure. <coughs> Debug is available. The only debugger you should consider teaching is CDBX. And we can play around with CDBX on the system uh, later this week, if you like. Or bring it up and use it on Bowpace, something like that. And there is an absolute debugger. With ADB, you need load maps and listings and a calculator to figure addresses out. But CDBX saves you everything. A couple other things CDBX can do. It can, it can connect to a checkpoint file. So you can go into a checkpoint file and change things. And it will also connect to a process that you didn't start off with. For example, a system administrator sees some hung process. He can go in, attach to it, modify something, get out of it, and maybe the code can continue running. So you can attach to other processes and checkpoint files with CDBX. And if you're teaching it on site, it's the same syntax as DBX. And it replaces two old tools called DRD and DDA. User said, why do we need a, to learn a new debugger? Let's use a standard Unix debugger language. So DRD and DDA's code was cut into CDBX. So the CDBX interface was there with this uh, previous Cray code underlayered. They didn't throw the code away. They just stitched them together. And then we have all our libraries and multitasking uh, capabilities as well. Uh, next page is about multitasking. Not much to say. You have macro tasking is library level identical. <coughs> micro tasking, the Cray 2 implemented it in 4.0. And because of hardware differences, there are implementation differences. But the uh, compiler directives are still the same. So the way they get it done is slightly different because of the architecture. But the user doesn't see any difference. Everything he knew about multitasking in COS is still valid. And autotasking as well. Autotasking happens only at the loop level, is that correct? Yeah. As it, it inserts compiler directives for you and makes it easier for you to uh, get the code up and autotask. We're going to have somebody come in and talk about autotasking later in the week and give some handouts. and. Some numbers, too. She's got some benchmark numbers.
And file systems are different between COS and Unicos. The biggest thing that the users see is that all of the disk drives aren't theirs. In COS, the disk drives are treated as one big pool of disk drives. In Unicos, things are broken up into smaller partitions, or what are called file systems. So a file system is composed of file systems, each one being discrete from each other. And if one file system fills up, he cannot overflow into the other file system. All file system configuration is being done in a module called conf.c. And there are commands like uh, uh, disk map, uh, df, du, that tell you specifics about the file system you're working on. We're going to take a look at some uh, examples of that coming up. Now, something new with Unicos 5.0 is temporary data sets, and I'm going to get that to that in a second. But first of all, the way that I compare the access statement, the access statement is a way of getting to the data set. And in Unicos, you do not need to access the file if it's in your existing directory. If it's in your existing directory, it will open automatically. It can find the inode information by default. But the access in an NQS job relates to copying a file from the permanent file system into that NQS temporary directory and then working with it. Or giving something like the full path name. So the access statement can be translated into a variety of different uh, situations depending upon how you run it on site. Now first of all, in COS we have the ownership attribute. In Unicos, you also have ownership. That's the person that creates the file, the owner of the process that creates the file. You can also compare ownership to a security compartment. And in Unicos, UDBGen sets up security compartments in terms of what compartments a user can get to. So those are two different levels or angles on the ownership uh, value in COS because it does compartmentize things on COS. Uh, but, but typically, if I were converting a job and it had ownership specified anywhere, I would throw that away. I wouldn't try to map that into anything. The next thing that we have is the permanent data set name. I would relate this to the file name. That's the file name. Uh, a PDN would be the file name in the file system that's permanent, such as in this case, all my sources, TRNG, DAW, Bowcase 3D, whatever in that directory. That's the permanent file that I'm using. So that would be the PDN, that full path name. DN then would be whatever I call it when I copy it into my local directory for an NQS job, whatever I'm using it, it as locally. And this is what the JCL converter does. The converter, however, does keep ownership as well, so that if owner is specified, it will map. But you probably don't want to do that. And you can trim it out. You can cut those lines out of the templates of the converter. Now, the full path name gets you to the data set in the same way as an access does. So in a lot of cases, the access can be just specifying the full path name. We had one case, and it was uh, zero 01 systems code, uh, where rather than having the data actually in our temporary directory, we write it in on standard in from slash, uh, we'll just say trng, tng, uh, data. And we gave a full path name and directed the data into the application. The other way we could have done it, just to get rid of some of this other stuff, is copy slash trng slash tng slash data to our local file system directory data, and then just redirect data into it. So this would be like an access, PDN, DN, like that, depending upon how you want to implement it when you put it on Unicos. Now, every NQS job is going to change to a temporary directory. And everything in that directory goes away when the job's done. So that would be your local data set concept, which would include Fortran units, as well as input and output files and things of that nature. So PDN, I call the file name. 
a permanent file name is a full path name typically, and then a, a relative or, or the directory file name would be the local data set name. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah, it's been done through dot profiles, and I'll show you the way it's been done in prior releases, but now it's built into the system. It was something that the uh, site would have to squeak into their profiles and stuff, but now it's handled more gracefully by the system. I'm going to show you the older way of doing it as well as the new way of doing it. So a full path name is always a full, it begins with a slash, it begins at root, it begins at the top of the file system. If you did that CD space root, that's where it begins, CD space slash, the top of the file system, and gives every directory down to the path name. The ID, in this case, there wasn't an ID, but maybe my ID was project. So then I'd have some directory here that would group all the related uh, files into project slash data. So ID would, to me, relate to a directory where you're grouping everything in a consistent directory that are all related. And this is what the converter will do. It'll go uh, ownership, ID, PDN to DN. Additions. There is an addition concept in Unix. It's explicit. Typically, you're going to do this like in a make file. You build in your make file in front of this access or in front of this copy that we did a move. And you rename data to old data. So it'd be something like TRNG. Now, in this case, we don't really have to, with this code, we don't have to change this because we're not saving it. But if, for example, we down here, a save would relate to the opposite direction. So let's do it with the save rather than the access, the save concept. So we're going to move uh, slash trng, tng project out to old out. And I'll leave out the, the stuff in front of that because I ran out of space. So you explicitly change the name of it and build that into your make file. And that's the way it works. The kernel itself, when you generate a kernel, has a revision number appended to the end of the name. So there's a variety of ways of explicitly building in an addition concept to make sure you don't overwrite a good binary or a good version. But that's the only way you can do it, is uh, user training to teach them to rename the thing before they start editing it or things like that, proper uh, maintenance techniques. It is not implied. There's no implied addition concept in Unix. But explicitly, you'll see it all the time. You'll see old file names you know, with a big OLD in front of them. And that's the last version. And a lot of sites don't keep more than two editions around. But with the kernel, the kernel has a way that it generates a dot one, dot two, dot three at the end of the file name. Every time the make file is generated, it appends one to the uh, end of the uh, files that it's generating. So you can invoke an addition concept. It's just not as transparent as it is in COS. But it can be done. The second thing I wanted to point out here is relative path names. Relative path names do not begin with a slash. The advantage of relative path names is that they're more portable across systems. One thing I might have wanted to do in here is instead of specifying all this, just specify dollar home. And then that's more portable across machines. Because different machines will possibly have different names for the file system uh, area that you're in. Uh, with relative path names, is usually the way hackers go. They change around. They just CD to the directories and hack around, do LSs, CD, LSs, that sort of thing. And, and basically, with the CD command, you're typically using relative path names to probe around in the system looking for things. Hopefully, your things that you, you know are in your directories. 
the Unix environment is designed to be a sharing environment. But then one of the things that you, we used to teach doing a link instead of a copy. That ra treating the access rather than a copy, we'd do a link. And a link would not move the data, but build a second inode pointing to the same data. Now we don't do that anymore. The reason being is because a link will not work across file systems. It won't go from slash TNG to slash C to slash temp. So depending upon how your file system is configured, it will not work across them. And the reason we've put NQS jobs off in their own file system is because they need a lot of space. And it's a big disk pool for everybody to use. So since it's outside, it's administrative control and it's outside of your home directory, it's like under slash temp, for example. The, it's easier to maintain that way. And the losses that you are going to actually do physical I.O. to move that data from there. But the other option, again, was to use a full path name on the invocation of the statement or something. For example, the output here we could just put out to uh, dollar home output. And just specify a relative path name rather than doing the copy. And with that way, the copy wouldn't have been needed that should have been here to follow that move. Am I making sense? Does this make sense to you? So this is how you're going to deal with the access command. Take a look at the code. If it's going to run under NQS, a call to access is going to be a call to copy. Or else specifying a full path name uh, on the, if it's standard in or standard out or however it is. So full path names, relative path names, uh, copies of the file into your temporary directory. These are ways of doing it. And it's really a case-by-case -case basis that you have to deal with it on. And again, access will not show up as a missing entry point. It will be satisfied. Uh, so I did show a link here in LN, but the disadvantage is that it won't go from one file system to the other. Dave? Yeah. Uh, let's deal with it now. Well, my question is, is, is it meant to be a tool to teach us how to get these jobs converted so mm. that eventually NQS will become obsolete? No, no. Be NQS is a batch control system. It's designed for jobs that run beyond the expectations of interactive response. And it's designed to control resources being submitted to the system. If we've got five jobs that want 256 mega memory, can we let all five go? No. So NQS is designed to be that batch interface. It will always be there because programmers will always have codes that run for months. But as far as the conversion tool that you have? The conversion tools I have, uh, the outputs it generates are generally going to have to be cleaned up by the programmer. But it will try to generate an NQS job, convert job statements to NQS directives and that sort of thing for uh, batch queue classification capabilities. And then say, oh, this guy needs this number of tape drives. Put him into whatever queue is appropriate as configured by the administrator. So it's basically a job class manager uh, tool. And that's all. And then this dollar tempter is something that not only uh, NQS knows about, but also the seg loader. You know, when seg loader uses scratch data sets in COS, you have a seg release to release those. Unicos, they're not in your job itself. They're off in the temporary file system. Uh, various other utilities will know about this temporary location for stuff to get rid of it. Uh, scratch files that are opened by the application and stuff. Because uh, codes can run and leave a humongous amount of scratch data around without this stuff. The NQS feature with this temporary directory also gives you the capability of running the same application or different applications that may use the same Fortran unit numbers. They can't run in the same directory because they're going to open files on the same file two different applications opening the same file, I think you're in trouble. One stepping on the other. So that's the other thing that this temporary directory concept gives to you. Now every time a job comes into the system, the system creates a directory for him. The administrator can specify where that directory is going to be. Around here, I think it's slash temp. If you're on a 218 or something, try echoing dollar temp dir and see what it says. That's going to be where the administrator says, you can put your scratch stuff, and he's going to clean it off when the job's done. 
the NQS stuff will take care of it for you and clean it up for you. Uh, I'm not sure with 5-hole with this feature. I'll sh with my stuff, it would remain there. It would only clean it up if it terminated abnormally. Since this is a new feature, I really haven't used it yet on a 5 system. And uh, maybe we can try it this week. But every job we'll have in the beginning of the job, the first thing is a CD to dollar tempter. And from that point on, he's running in a temporary directory. But uh, cleanup is some questions I have to the developer as well. And he didn't know NQS, so he couldn't answer it either. But prior to 5 all people were doing this with traps. They'd set a trap to remove the directory when it was done. And I'll show you that example. So dollar home slash dir slash file or ID file, that sort of thing, would, would be a relative name that would be typically found in codes because dollar home guarantees portability for your input and output data. And then Fortran units and stuff would all be within your dollar tempter file. And then a CD to dollar tempter <coughs> to, to get to this temporary directory. When you log in, it's just created for you. Now, I have in my profiles a test to say that if I'm coming in as a batch job, change for me. So you can bury it in the profile rather than you know, putting it explicitly in the job. And that's just a matter of uh, setting up the administration of the system that way. And tempter is typically, I think, around here under slash temp. If anyone's on 218, try echo dollar tempter and see what it says. I also have a note here about moving file to old file being an addition concept, a very crude, explicit addition concept, or file.1, file.2, that sort of thing. So I used to teach link, though. I prefer to teach copy now, because these temporary directories typically in a different file system, a big disk pool. Because if you run it under your home directory, you're going to hog a lot of disk space and then release it. And you're going to fight over disk space because one file group is going to want the space. Another file group is going to want the space. They all got to share this big pool to run their jobs and maintain their source and data in their smaller file system pieces. That's really the way it works. And that's the hardest part is getting enough file space for people to do their work and have enough file space for the NQS jobs to run. Around here, we were putting the NQS jobs under dollar home, and we'd always run out of file space. So now they've given us a big pool for it. Up here is just showing a tree, a typical thing of slash user, home, directory, and file. Interesting thing I saw last week is Macintosh is using NFS to Unix systems. So you're on a Mac, too, and you're opening up folders, each one being a directory concept, and going in with a Macintosh and VEIing Unicos files. Uh, one of our instructors here has his Mac 2, and he just opens up files on the Cray and edits them with VI. And they're all folder concepts, icons and stuff like that. The second one, the user ownership would relate to dollar home, who the user or the login is. ID would relate to the directory. PDN would relate to the file. And if you had addition concepts, you, you could do one step further or something. But I wouldn't recommend nesting it that deep. And then also you have uh, directories over here where there's a temporary directory and the file's running in there. And again, an access in 5 terms would be a copy. And then, or let's put it to this one, copy that way. And then a save would be a copy back. Or use full path names, either way. And I guess full path names would be preferable because you don't have the copy overhead. It's doing all the I.O. into the other partition. So the relationship to a data set catalog is uh, super blocks and inodes. And a DNT relates to an inode as well. Now, this is the way I used to do it up until 5.0. And some of this can still be done. I put in my dot profile, in my user dot profile, because I didn't have access to the system one, a test. I said, if test, TTY. Now, TTY is a command. It tells you what TTY number you're coming in on. And if you're not interactive, you're not coming in on a TTY. 
And if you type in TTY with a batch job, put it in an MQS job, it will say not a TTY. If you're interactive, it'll give you your TTY number. So back daggers around that says uh, execute. Now you want to fix your example. There should be double quotes around that TTY back dagger stuff. The double quotes delimits this whole string because what's going to come out of that is going to execute and substitute its output in that command line. This is something slicker than anything Coast could ever do. And I'll show you some other examples later. So TTY will be executed by the back daggers and in that substitution will be not a TTY. And then the double quotes will delimit it so that it's treated as a single string. And it's going to say if test that string equals not a TTY. So change the hyphen NE to an equal sign. So it's going to say if what's coming out of TTY says not a TTY, then we must be an NQS job. And if we're an NQS job, then we create this variable and make a directory for it and change to it. Now I don't need all of that anymore now. I don't need any of that anymore. All I need to do now 